you know, we're all sitting there looking at it. Someone had the wherewithal to call the lab and said, are you sure? And before, and this was when we delivered the lab people. So we were like all great friends. And we thought, are you, she said, we're running it already because we don't believe the numbers either. Because people don't come in with leukemia on labor and delivery. How about a hemoglobin and manicure in the 20 and 58? It's commonly referred to as heme concentration. Remember third stacy you flew it out, so that's just red cells floating around? Okay. In my 50 years, I've never seen it this high. Highest maybe with a hemoglobin of 15, but not 20. Platelet 74. If you see platelet count of 74, what are you thinking? Thrombocytopenia or pre-eclampsia. Because this lab test, when it comes up, you have 10 seconds, you're calling your physician. Right? Okay. None of that in this combination makes any sense. Let's talk about the patient. See the time up there? Came in at midnight. She's term. We're going to induce her the next morning, but she took three buses to get to the hospital. You think we're going to send her out at midnight? We're going to start her induction now. Put in the, back then we used something called prostaglandin gel. They used to mix it down in the pharmacy with the prostin and um, something else, and they'd come up in a syringe. We were very creative, but now we have the little Cervidels and stuff to use. So, of course, she comes in, we put a line in, we send a CBC type and screen, standard. Okay? Day shift comes on. Hand off report. She's sleeping. She has a half walk in. CBC and type and screen are on the chart. We're going to start hit probably here in a few minutes, blah, 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 blah. Four o'clock in the afternoon. I love my epidural. This is the first person was that actually looked at this lab test. I did one, yes. Who do you think? How about anesthesia? And what does the dude say? No! Your platelets are 74. What's the reaction on the unit? Oh, ah, we have help syndrome. Ha ah, ah, ha help syndrome. We all started looking at this going, huh? 20 and 58? The white counts too. That's what we did. The whole big pre-planting workup, CBC, urine, because she had a Foley at that point. We did it all. You know what her white count was? 11.3. You know what her hemoglobin and medicare was? 11 and 22. You know what her platelet count was? 186. This, ladies, is a lab error. This is an error. Think midnight. What do you think the lab's doing? What do we do every day to our equipment? Do we rot run QAs? When the glucometers, don't we run QAs every morning on that silly little machine, make us all crazy? Do we not check off our crash cart? And our postpartum hemorrhage carts, do we not go, go around to check, make sure all the toys work so when the emergency hits the fan, we are ready? Lab does this to all their equipment at midnight. Do you think they flush the unit properly to get a correct result? What should have happened is that night nurse, when she saw it, hey, are you sure this is right? Just like we did. To diagnose the leukemia. Someone should have picked up the phone and said, hey, and if the night nurse didn't, that day nurse should have. Hey, this doesn't make sense. On top of it, she did get her epidural, she did deliver, and guess what we did the next morning? We drew a whole nother panel because we wanted to make sure. That is $5,000 worth of unnecessary lab work when all someone had to do was pick up the phone and say, hey, unnecessary. 
And on top of that, she was clinic trust. So guess who paid that bill? All of you. Clinic trust provides, um, back in this these days, made sure that the city of Alexandria provided money to the hospital to pay for indigent care. Because many times these ladies, because they were illegal, did not qualify for Medicaid. They now do. So if you draw up, you're crying out loud, look at it. Establish your work habits now. What's normal and what's not? Communicate. Night shift used to hate to give me a report on labor and delivery because I'd open up the chart and say, okay, let's look at everything. Because if you're handing that patient off to me, you better have your act together. And if not, I'm going to take this opportunity to teach you. Trend the labs in the computer. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. In majority of our cases, they're going to get worse before they turn the corner and get better. Now is your time to get your good work habits. And remember, labs can remain in the pregnant lab value range at least up to six months or sometimes longer. This is an actual case history. Patient came in at 32 weeks. Not, I love, I love when they come in and say, I don't feel right. I don't feel well. Your spidey sense should be up. Trust your gut and trust them. And decrease fetal movement. Got her care in New York, but came to Virginia for the Thanksgiving holiday. This was the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So how's your staffing? Of course, no records, because like her sister said, who was translating for her, if there was a problem, we wouldn't have come. So it's the Saturday after Thanksgiving, Spanish speaking, the sister was translating. Um, when she hit labor and delivery, there was no fetal heart. What is, what do you have to do if there is no fetal heart? You have to confirm it with ultrasound that there is no heart rate present. Blood pressure on admission. I'm going to give you the physical that if you walked in the room, this is the information you have, and I want you to tell me what's going on. Blood pressure 120 over 70. She's got an IV in the right AC. We did the no prenatal care lab. And the night nurse, because this was 6.45 in the morning, said she keeps bleeding from her IV site. What do you think's going on? One, is she stable? I see she head shifting this way. Okay, good. Anybody else? Okay, here's another tidbit of information. She has a rock hard uterus. I, it's as hard as this table. I can't indent. And she's white as this sheet of paper. Somebody said it. I heard it. Tony said shock over here. Like septic. Huh? Septic shock. Not septic, but she's in shock. But her blood pressure is 120 over 70, which was what was throwing everybody off. Let's look at her labs. The first one labs are the ones we drew when she hit the door. White count 17. Okay. Either she's, you know, remember we've got stress going on. 9 and 28. Why is her H and H in the low zone? Not dangerous yet, but in the low zone. How about my friend platelets? We went running down the hall, anesthesia in the docks, so down the doctor's lounge. We're going to have platelets 48. Anesthesia goes get another line in and give her blood. There in creatinine. This should have been the first clue. 1.9. What lab test that goes up? What are we making that diagnosis on? But her blood pressure is 120 over 70. ALT, AST, LDH, they're all elevated. Look at my friend fibrinogen, 55. Okay, now remember, not five they can fight. Remember, that's only two digits. So it's below 100. So that's like,
She got a unit of pack sales, fresh frozen platelets. We had the second unit of RBCs hanging on the way to the operating room around 10 o'clock. When you deliver a stillbirth by a C-section, it is called a hysterotomy because we are removing the fetus placenta and membranes. Under general, we got in and we got out. And we had a bed waiting in the hallway to go right over to the unit. We noted an abruption and a cuvillier uterus at delivery. Cuvillier uterus looks like the, how many here have seen a normal uterus at a section? It's pink, it's shiny, it's healthy, it's oxygenated. A cuvillier uterus looks like someone beat it to death with a baseball bat. Black and blue, because what happens is the blood bleeds into the tissue like a big bruise. And then it tamponaded on itself, which is why she wasn't dead on arrival and why her blood pressure was 120 over 70. It was keeping her alive because she technically should have bled out. We didn't know why, but we were pretty sure we had a good idea because of the serum creatinine. She was pretty clamptic and abrupted due to high blood pressure. Here's how scary this one was. We went to put the Foley in. We weren't sure if we got in the urethra because we didn't get in the urine out. So took, took the gloves and went, okay, that's there. There And, you know, we literally looked, okay, that's a vagina. That's the rectum. We know we're in the right place. And finally, during the case, we got this much urine in the tube. So we tipped it got it to the port, sent it off, and we, it came back in just that little bit, greater than 300 milligrams of protein in the urine. So that gave us a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Now, because we were successful in fluid resuscitating her with blood products and IVs, we got a blood pressure reading now 170 over 90. We started mag at a gram an hour, but for only four hours because her kidneys were so compromised, but we didn't want her to seize. So she got four hours of mag, but the mag stayed elevated for almost two days. She got on dialysis. And I literally had a nurse say, but she was stable because her blood pressure was 120 over 70. She was hanging on by her fingernails and staying alive. She was no more stable than I'm pregnant and I'm going to be 70. Okay. Not happening, kids. Don't let one thing throw you off. Look at all the pieces and put it together. Does that make sense? She was really in shock. And that is Kugler uterus. That's an ugly little thing. And we've seen quite a few of those puppies. Here's the second one. This young lady came to us at 23 and 6 with a diagnosis of chronic hypertension with severe features. We had delivered her two years before a 27 weeker. On, yes, ma'am. I was going to after the next scenario. Yep, not a problem, because I got a P2. She delivered about uh, two years before this, a 27-weeker that didn't make it as well. MFM said, let's do beta, baseline labs, 24-hour urine. The night of the 8th, she started to complain of nausea and pain in her back right here, right under that right scapula. When they get pain under there, that is your liver starting to swell. She refused the IV start at three in the morning, but said, okay, I'll let you draw the labs. Can you put an IV in if she refuses? No, it's called a salt and battery. You can be charged. And they called the labs but she was already showing signs of trouble. Guess who her day shift nurse was? Guess who walked in and said, Katie, cut the crap. 
you're getting sick on me. I need to put a line in and call Doc. She was someone that needed control. And she looked at me because I had taken care of her the, the time before. And she goes, I know, Betsy, I just, I, I just don't want to accept that this is happening again. So here's her labs. So let's look at them, the first line of labs. She's not sick. She's just coming in. So H&H, &H, 13 and 38, that is heme concentration. Platelets are 131. Okay, remember, like I said, just because one lab is off does not mean we go running down the hall calling the code, okay? But pay attention. Stand creatinine at 0.7. ALT, ASC, <coughs> LDH is okay. Fibrinogen. Fibrinogen that starts with a T is trouble. Her urine protein dip was negative, but look what her 24 hours show, 306. By virtue of the definition, she is chronic hypertension with preeclampsia. Yes, because remember, you've got the 24 hour urine showing 306. The following morning, Remember, she's had beta methasone, so what two lab levels on this, there's no glucose present, what two lab levels should be elevated? Platelets and bingo. So look, 13 to 18, 131 to 164. Do you see the change? The night of the 8th, remember she's got severe pain here. What's her platelets? Remember, she's had two doses of beta. We're still in the honeymoon phase. But look at the liver enzymes. Is that over 70, 70, and 350? Not quite, but we're over 70, yes? When the liver enzymes start to climb, when you say, do you have epigastric pain? Now, I always have to differentiate. There's this pain, which is, give me some tums. Or is it like someone's taking a knife and slicing them, especially if they're talking about pain under that right scapula? Because that's the liver expanding. Oops. Look at four hours. Four hours. Because she was the first room I walked into. Look where the white can is gone in four hours. Look what the platelets did in four hours. Remember, the beta methasone kept it up. The beta methasone is now going out of her system, so it's falling. And you're now getting the true picture of what's happening. And her platelets have increased tenfold in four hours. We went to the OR. And look at your friend fibrinogen. 338, two, three, blah, 324, 271, 187. This lady's going down the tubes. We're heading into DIC. She did end up in the unit. The baby at 24 weeks and two was delivered. Uh, unfortunately, went up to Georgetown on ECMO and died in three weeks. Little girl. This is the sickest patient we have ever had to date. Pain to labor and delivery. Um, from antenatal testing with twins, IUGR on one twin, rule out preeclampsia. Oh, and I might add she was also IVF. Whenever you've got IVF or IUI, start looking for problems because of the process involved. It's not a natural occurring pregnancy. 26 and 6, prime F, came to us. Those are her labs. So already we've got heme concentration, platelets of 201. Her ALT and AST are, well, the one is at the max and the one is elevated. And we have a fibrinogen of 692. Honey, I was partying with that one. This was the first time we could compare a UA, a PCR, and a 24-hour urine. The urine dip was no protein. PCR was 0.3. And her 24-hour urine is 455 by virtue of Elevated blood pressures and uh, 24 hour urine. What is our diagnosis? Preeclampsia. Excellent. 
We're going to look down here briefly. She came to us in 2014 in December at around nine to 10 weeks. Whenever you have twins, you bring them in early to determine what's called coronicity. We need to know what the membranes, how are these babies set up? Are they die die, two little separate entities, mono die, where they're sharing the chorion, but they've got two amnions? Or are they mono mono, they're all in the same sac? So the best time to do that is nine to 10 weeks gestation because we can really see those dividing membranes. Look what her first pressure was, 131 over 89. Not run down the hall screaming, but that's a little on the high side. Would you not agree? Okay. When she hit us on the 19th, 178 over 106. You can bet your bippy we got her upstairs really fast. And we started her on Procardia 30, um, 30 to 90 XL. All right, so you see the first line of labs. Look at the second line of labs on the 19th. She's had beta, that's what the little star means. So what should have gone up? White count and platelets. Did they? She's right, they didn't go up. What should they have done? Should they have not gone up to like 240? They didn't. Why not? She got beta and it should have gone up, but it didn't. So your spidey sense should be on point right now because what's really happening? They're really going down and the beta methasone is just holding it at 201 or 202. Look at the second morning. She got the second dose. White hand still up there. Like, let's just up a smooch. Very professional term, smooch. Just a little. They should have gone up higher. They didn't. Look at her ALT, AST. Ever so slightly. This is what's called trending the labs. Ever so slightly creeping up. Scary little monsters, aren't they? So, and the morning of the 21st, white cats come down. Now we're finally seeing a little bit of an edge coming off the uh, platelets, but look where the uh, ALT, AST is doing. On the night of the 22nd, where does she start complaining of the pain? Enough that we had to start a morphine PCA. That's how much pain she was in. And the doc that was on did something we never even thought to do. They did an ultrasound at the bedside of her liver. And they had a hematoma of 14 by 11 by 6. It basically doubled the size in the liver capsule because she was bleeding out of her, the capsule was basically holding the blood in. This is for those of you who work in Fairfax where you have residents. Do not let the residents run the liver, in other words, palpate the liver. Uh, when you've got someone with severe liver pain, you can rupture the liver. If the liver ruptures, there have been a couple cases in the literature, one which was at Duke, they exhausted the blood supply in the state of North Carolina to save this woman's life. Her blood uh, volume was replaced either five or six times over. That was the amount of blood she lost. The only thing that saved her is Duke has a trauma center. And they were able to sew it back up. Small community hospital, she'll be dead. Do not let the residents palpate it because they can feel that edge. But if they push the wrong way and that thing ruptures, you've got a major problem on your hands. We decided, started her on mag. Now look at where her platelets have come down to. We're finally starting to see the true picture. Look where her liver enzymes are at. They're continuing to climb. 
We uh, sectioned her at three o'clock, around two, three in the afternoon, two little girls, one pound 10, one pound eight. They did great. Um, on the 23rd, her white count is now to 28. Look at where her liver enzymes are at in the 1600s, 2900. On the 24th, we are now calling, we're, she's now over in the ICU at this point because we're kind of at a loss because the white count, I'd never seen a white count of 50, but because of the tissue damage and what was going on in the liver, that's why it was up that high. I've never seen, other than this case, liver enzymes in the 7,000s. Never seen, um, her platelets were holding a little more steady. But what we did, we used to do, I used to do policy. And like I said, I love up to date because up to date saved this lady's life because we were trying to work on hypertension and all that other stuff. And one of the things in the help section was, embolize the liver because we were at a loss because she, her counts were going down. I mean, we were trying to do everything. I took it to the doctor. I highlighted it. I said, do you think Dr. Sterling could do this to stop the bleeding? We embolized the liver. It didn't kill the whole thing because, you know, all you need is a little bit of liver and it regrows. So they did that. She was discharged in April Hepatic necrosis with subcapsular hematoma. The follow-up MRI showed marked improvement to the liver because it had already started to regenerate. Sickest lady I ever saw, but that's okay, guys, because what? Nothing ever happens in OB. We had infection. The, the, the people that we had on this case were like unreal. This did get written up as a, as a, a case presentation because we'd never seen stuff like this before. That's it. Any questions? All right. Is it there? What's up here? Can they see it now? But they're not talking. Can they Sorry, hear us? I was trying to get up the presentation. Can you see and hear now? Oh, yes, yes, yes is coming over. Okay. And now for something we all know and love, diabetes. We're going to define what it is and impact on pregnancy. What are the classification? What are blood glucose levels and what do they mean to us? And what are our meds? This is the definition of diabetes. I think we all know what it is. Um, pathophys. Complex disorder, hypoglycemia affects uh, pregnant during pregnancy affects seven to eighteen percent of all significant morbidity and mortality even following the newborn. We've got a lot of different types, but the ones we encounter in our world are gestational type ones and type twos. This is the prevalence. Um, this was from 2016. That's the latest data I got. I probably should go into CDC and see if they have anything different. Maybe between now and December or next year. So type one, if you understand the way the three of them work, type one mom makes no insulin. She's got to get it from an outside source. Type two is insulin resistance which means you need you are making insulin but you need higher levels to deal with what's going on and gestational is also an insulin resistance as well as carbohydrate intolerance because our friend the placenta is <laughs> wreaking havoc on the pregnancy it's influencing it like crazy and again the more placentas you have, the more problem you have. Whoops, went too fast. It accounts for approximately, your type ones are about 5% of all the cases. Again, no insulin production. They think 
there is a genetic susceptibility. However, we are seeing more of the environmental effects, such as viruses, our friend COVID, patient, like I said, I interviewed yesterday, her diabetes started after a bout with pneumonia, and she's a type 1. Um, they are much more sensitive to the amount of insulin that they get, uh, which is why if you ever look at the amounts of insulin that they receive, they're in the much smaller uh, dosing levels than those of us that are um, insulin resistant, the type 2s or the GDMs. Um, it's that pre-diabetes thing that's going on. Um, mom, the individual is, they're usually um, more dietary control that they, someone has diagnosed them and told them this, and now they're trying to get things under control with exercise and diet. Usually. Um, excuse me. Type twos are 90 to 95% of the adult diabetic cases. There's abnormal insulin secretion diagnosed in adulthood, supposedly linked with genetics and obesity. But I will tell you that just because you're obese does not mean you're a diabetic. And just because you're diabetic does not mean you're obese. Boy, is that a, you know, a, thing to try to take into your brain first thing in the day. I've seen women at 400 pounds come in and they are not diabetic. And I've seen women at 102 pounds that are diabetic. Perfect example. I'm sure everybody here knows who Haley Berry is, the actress. Have you ever seen that girl in a swimsuit? There is not an ounce of fat anywhere. And she hides her, her insulin pump too. She's a type one. So do not assume. There's a lot of data on here that I, you know, you can read through because I'm going to get to try to get to the important things such as dietary control, what are the meds that we're using, and how they all work. Um, typical onset is prior to the age of 30 for type 1s, but like I said, with the viruses that are out there, we are seeing an increased number. Um, they, um, I was out with my neighbor the other day, her kids were in town, um, and I was, you know, over there, hi, hi, you know, being the good neighbor, uh, cause she had also had a new grandbaby and I said, oh, how good. And she says, yeah, she did really well, even, you yeah. know, with her insulin pump and all. And I said, huh, what insulin pump come to find out her daughter and her son both got diagnosed with type one diabetes and there's no family history. They got diagnosed after they had a bad virus. So we're not, we're not done. Okay. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring that. I don't know about you. I ignore that thing all the time. Um, type ones have to have insulin. Here's the interesting thing. When they deliver, once the placenta is gone for the first 24 to 48 hours, they do not need insulin. Um, and you have to be very careful because if these girls come in with insulin pumps, you do know that there's a policy that covers outside um, equipment when you bring it into the hospital. You do know that it has to be checked by biomed. But yet I can guarantee anybody that comes in with an insulin pump, it's not checked. And how many in this room, I'm going to ask the question, how many in this room are a type 1 diabetic? How many in this room are a type 2? Right. How many in this room are comfortable managing a pump? I don't know what they did. But also, like, is that the full story? But like, yet these ladies will be on your labor and postpartum unit. Postpartum nurses, my kid. if they're oh, putting no. their pump back on, if they've taken it off for whatever reason, they need their pre-pregnant dose 
on postpartum. Baby is out, placenta is gone. They need the pre-pregnant dose because on an average, the amount of insulin by the end of the pregnancy that a type one is using is maybe four times what they were on when they weren't pregnant. At Loudon, a patient delivered, she had her pump on and did not change her settings from pregnant to less. And she went into a significant hypoglycemic response because she was tired, she'd had the baby. She didn't realize that she didn't need that much insulin, okay? Dosing is best accomplished for all the diabetics using what we call um, the, the, excuse me, the type ones like to use a pre-meal dosing schedule. In other words, they are gonna sit down and eat X carbohydrates and they're going to program their pump for X amount of insulin, as well as they run a basal behind the scenes. Type 1s know their disease. They can teach you things like you've never heard. They've been the ones that have taught me what I know. However, when they come to see MFM and the OBs, our world our brains work on what is a postprandial blood sugar. In other words, two, one to two, depending on which practice you're in, one to two hours in the postprandial period, which drives the type ones crazy because they say, okay, if I'm doing post meal, I'm making the corrections for the next day. Why am I doing that? Why am I not covering in the immediate? time frame to cover what I'm eating. Does that make sense? So you got you got to work with these girls because they will pick you out of the crowd that you don't understand what's going on. Type twos, again, are insulin resistant. They have maybe decreased insulin production, so we've got to give it a little bit of help. Um, there is a strong association with diabetes, with obesity, but again, it's not always the case. With the type two, again, they may not need anything in the first 24 to 48 hours till all that circulating stuff gets out from the placenta. But here's the scary thing. A lot of the type twos that we're seeing do not even have endocrinologists because they don't know they're a type two. Or maybe they just got diagnosed, but now the OB's handling them, so they haven't seen the endocrinologist. So those girls are a challenge because we've had them walk in the door like the lady yesterday that had a hemoglobin A1C of 11. That's dangerous because uh, we like them under uh, six if we can. Um, they may not need any insulin or medication in the postpartum period. And many times they're put back on whatever they were doing before. But we have to make sure these girls are plugged into the system that they are seeing an endocrinologist to manage their sugars. The GDMs, remember, once they're delivered, they should be okay, but some of them maintain and turn into type twos. But because they are babies at home, they don't have time to come in and get tested. We don't have time for this. They're not gonna take any medicine. The excuses go on and on and on. And then we don't get them until they're back in for the next baby. And then lo and behold, they're now turned into a type two uh, and we've got a whole nother mess on our hands. Um, GDM can be divided into two types, one that's controlled by diet and activity. The second one is with medications. Uh, it's very close, like I said, to type twos. Um, Pregnancy, if you remember anything, again, it's a diabetic state uh, due to the crazy hormones that are, are wreaking havoc in our bodies. Um, and again, there's a lot of placental hormones that are going on. One of the cool things, but I guess it's not really cool. One of the things that we learn is that we can tell the placenta is starting to fail by the amount of insulin mom is on. For example, a few years, well, quite a few years back, it was around uh, Christmas, young lady 
350 pounds, first baby. Dr. Gadini sent her up to labor and delivery where I was still working at the time. And he goes, this woman just, she doesn't understand. She's not following the instructions. If anybody knows Dr. Gadini, he talks very fast. And I'm like, give me, give me 24, 48 hours with her. I will teach her. Because not everybody is BSN college prepared individuals. We have ladies out there that God bless, they try their best. They can barely read and write in their own language, but yet they'll try to create a log for us as best they can. So it's not non-compliance that I'm just not doing it. It's non-compliance because they don't have the skills to read, write, and understand. Does that make sense? So this young lady had some I, I, I will call them some deficits, but she was trainable. I could teach her. Simple, easy, slow, and repeating. This is how you check your sugar. Okay, but remember, you ate here, so when are you doing it? Two hours. What time is that? Okay, over and over. We got it. Within 24 hours, we had her home. We had the dietitian going over everything, so when she was on the floor, the tray came up, she puts her call light on. She goes, Miss Betsy, I can't eat this and this because that's too many of those carbohydrates. But I can, you know, she was paying attention. And yes, that's correct. But let's put this one aside. Let's use this for your snack. So as a nurse, you have to understand what can they eat and what amount. Remember, it's all portion and how much. So she was on close to in a 24 hour period. So she was getting NPH and regular in the morning, regular with supper, NPH at bedtime. She was on um, probably close to 400 units by the time she delivered. This was before my chart. This was before smartphones. So the clinic used to put her on for her appointments every Monday. And as proud as punch, she would come walking into clinic with her paper in her notebook. I bought her a notebook so she could record everything. And she would come in with her notebook and then and then she would tell the nurse, call over to labor delivery, see if Miss Betsy's there. I want to take my paper over to show her. Because Dr. Gadini was downstairs, so she would see him and she'd come up and see me. That's when you could come on the units, not like it is now. And she'd come in proud as punch. This is great. Did they change this here? Yes, ma'am. They're oh, okay. She shows up Christmas Eve. And her AFI is 3.6. What does that tell me? The placenta is shutting down. And then she says to the nurse in ATC, you know, I had to drink milk. Miss Betsy said drink milk if my sugar's 60 and I'm shaky. And, the, and she said, well, how many times have you been drinking milk? Every day. And her sugars were in the 50s and whatnot, and they were coming up. Now, remember, she's on 400 units of insulin divided across the day. We cut her in, they sent her up to labor and delivery because now we're gonna hydrate her. Well, 350 pound woman, do you think we could get an IV in? Anesthesia got a 22 in right here, in her pinky. And we were able to get a couple liters of fluid and she had to stay with us overnight on Christmas. And they rescanned her on the 26th and her fluid level had reaccumulated. What that tells me is two things. The drop in her sugars due to her amount of insulin and the low fluid tells me I have, the placenta has shut down. She was about 36 and change. And literally Christmas day, I called Dr. Gadini at home Christmas morning. I said, these are what her sugars did. And we were on half the amount. He said, stop the insulin. 400 units to zero. Her sugars for the next week were textbook perfect because we sent her home on the 26th to come back again, of all things, New Year's Eve. Only this time, instead of showing up at 2.30 in the afternoon, we made her come in at nine o'clock in the morning because a 350 pound woman, if I have to get a, a pick line or a midline catheter put in, 
there is no VARD team at Alex uh, on holidays and CVIR won't put them in. So we had to make sure that we could get a line in her because if we had to deliver her, a 22 in her pinky is not the way to go. So we, of course, this time when she came in, her AFI had dropped to one. She's not on any insulin. But it showed the influence of the placenta <laughs> on what your sugars do. And she was funny. She said, can I deliver at midnight and be the first baby? I said, no. Because you don't want a diabetic at midnight, if you can avoid it, um, delivering a baby that's going to have at 37 and change. She may have some breathing, breathe, ugh, breathing difficulties because, you know, those diabetic babies don't mature like the rest of them do. So the placenta is our lovely little problem here. Um, those are all the different um, crazy hormones that are going on. Women who develop hyperglycemia and are diagnosed, they also think that they may have a problem anyway with carbohydrates even prior to the pregnancy. <clears throat> you have increased levels of progesterone and estrogen stimulates hypertrophy of the beta cells. Key word, if you remember anything, is the placenta. And diabetes uncontrolled is a, um, it, it's very bad on the baby. You do not want to be going into diabetes with super high hemoglobin A1C levels. Um, this is what goes on with the little person. Remember one thing, if mom's glucose is out of control, let's just use a round number so our brains can do the math. Mom's sugar's in say 200, it's not being controlled. It comes through the baby, through the cord. That baby's only going to use 120 milligrams of glucose coming from mom. Because what the baby will do then is pee it out. Now, if you check amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid has glucose in it. And what do babies do with their amniotic fluid? Yep. So what's the baby doing? Getting a double whammy of sugar. So that's why their, their little pancreases are being insulted. That's why the babies look like little sumo wrestlers. They are not healthy babies. They have a very difficult time maintaining their glucose and their body temperature, which is why you have to watch these little ones very, very closely because it stimulates the pancreas resulting in hyperinsulin and hyper, yeah, that word, and hy hyperinsulin is that infamous gro growth hormone. Let's just put it this way. It's just bad all the way around. Whoops a daisy. We got here. Good Lord, this thing is hopping all over the place. You want to get them into counseling ahead of time? because um, you want to get their A1C levels down to at least 6.5 or less, um, because you have an increased risk of fetal congenital anomalies and spontaneous um, miscarriages. The biggest problem, what organ is formed at six weeks in the little embryo? What's the first organ that they can see? The heart, which is why babies get echoes on diabetic moms at around 20 weeks, we have to see, especially if she came to us with uncontrolled diabetes, uh, we got to see, is there any major cardiac? It's it's high on the list for uh, problems. Um, this is the screening. Um, you can review it. I'm not going to go over it. Um, after 20 weeks, what the screening is. Because there are certain ethnic groups that we will screen earlier than later. Um, you can screen at 18 weeks and have negative glucose screens 
and screen at 28 weeks and be positive. So we want to make sure um, everybody knows the one hour glucose test. It's miserable. You don't have to fast. You drink 50 grams of glucola. You wait an hour and you get the, you. it's a blood draw. The three hour glucola is a nightmare. That's 100 grams of glucola. I usually make sure they have something they can throw up in because some of the women do right away because that's too much sugar. People with gastric sleeves or gastric bypasses cannot do the glucose tests. They have to do what they call the jelly bean test. They eat jelly beans instead. Or they just don't even, uh, I've had a couple of them say, we're not doing either of those. Just give me a glucometer and I'll test and give me dietary instruction. And I'm going to check my fasting and two-hour postprandials for the pregnancy. And if they want to do that, that's fine. So how to screen, again, that's the 50 gram load. They don't have to fast. The problem with the one hour glucose test, 20 of them, 20% of them are falsely elevated. So you don't know if it's real. If it's false, if it's elevated, you're gonna do the three hour right after. The three hour test, um, you do a fasting, drink the stuff, then you draw it at one hour, two hour, and um, three hour intervals. It must go to the lab in a blood tube. You cannot do a glucometer check. We had a nurse do that one day, and we didn't find out about it until about a couple weeks later. And I thought the doc was going to hit the ceiling. She started screaming at me, and I said, stop right there. I didn't do it, and I can tell you who did it. Um, but it has to be blood readings, blood test, not a glucometer. If it's two of the four results elevated, um, those girls will uh, are diagnosed. Um, I will tell you if the one hour is 180, I will tell you that they will not do the three hour. They will go right into diabetic education, get a couple weeks of uh, glucose test, you know, finger stick testing. They may start them on something such as metformin. They're going to send them to us down in the antenatal testing center and we'll go from there. These are your target labs. Um, in pregnancy, you want the fasting less than 95, or yeah, fasting um, 95 pre meal around 100. But our, you know, if you've got the um, patients that are type ones, that's how they have to look at it. One hour, 140, two hour, 120. Here's the key thing you have to remember. Um, my group at Alex, uh, and I'm pretty sure Fairfax gets them, Greater Prince William County Health Clinics. They're from Manassas, Woodbridge, <laughs> Dumfries. When you get their glucose readings, they do it at one hour. So you have to ask them these one hour or two hours after the meals. Because a one hour, you can be 140 or less, two hours, 120 or less which gets really confusing sometimes. But it says right on their sheet from Greater Prince William, um, one hour. Um, do not use alcohol on the fingers. Wash your hands well with soap and water. Alcohol does two things. Alcohol will toughen your fingertips, requiring that you have to Use a deeper pen stick. Yes, this is my glucometer. So these are pretty much the standard ones. They look like the pen. Um, they have different platforms depending on how deep. They usually have little numbers. And that tells you how deep the the pink the pick will be. Spring action. I tell all my ladies, 
bring your equipment to the hospital because the hospital, I call this the picky device, but ever take a look next time you do one. It's, it's uh, like a little knife in there. It cuts because it's for all people. So if you've got very calloused work hands versus I know you girls are nice and soft and well moisturized. And it's not it's not catered to how deep because you need just barely a drop. Now, unfortunately, you cannot use their readings in their machine. It has to be the hospital base that it feeds into Epic. But if you use alcohol, it toughens the fingers on these girls and you have to use a deeper pick. Alcohol will also change the glucose reading. So good old fashioned, did you wash your hands? Also, if they've handled fruit or something sweet, did you wash your hands? That's all you need. Um, also, we don't want to squeeze, rotate. I had one lady, she kept picking the same finger. That, that thing looked like a chicken had beaten on it because it looked terrible. But you also develop scar tissue and you can't get um, blood out of it. Here's your friend, the hemoglobin A1C. It is a screening tool. They will do it before when you arrive at your nine to 10 week confirmation because they want to see, have you been diabetic at all? And that sometimes is where we find them because we're all going to see the doctor every six months to a year, every year. So there's a lot of diabetics running around out there that they do not know that they are a diabetic. <clears throat> so hemoglobin A1C is we are looking at the amount of glucose on the red, excuse me, on the red blood cell. Because how long does a red blood cell live? The average life of the red blood cell is three months. So a hemoglobin A1C is going to look back over three months. Okay. So if your hemoglobin A1C is six, the average daily blood sugar is 120. If it is seven, add 30. If it is eight, add another 30. Or usually I tell people, if it's eight, your average daily blood sugar is 180. Go up 30 for nine, go down 30 for seven. I don't care how you do it, but it's in 30 milligram increments. Does that make sense? And this is the one test you can use across the board. Adults, pregnant or non-pregnant, male or female. <laughs> How many here can count carbohydrates in a diet? How many here can look at a plate and say, yep, that's correct, no, that's not. It is key because I love our dietary people, but sometimes they overload the trays. Or they're the patient, they don't know what type of a diet mom needs to be on. So the average breakfast, <coughs> excuse me, the average breakfast, you're looking at the carbohydrates. Now, I had a little girl yesterday from Greater Prince William. Yes, she's obese. She's four foot 11, 225 pounds. So she's one of those little, little people that's as tall as she is square. And we had to call her because her sugars in the morning were running in the 50s. And I said, are you shaky or anything? No but I'm waking up with spots before my eyes. And I'm like, well, that's hello. You know, she's too low, but the doctor told her um, they wanted her to lose weight. So she was only eating breakfast and lunch and not a snack at night. So we had to convince her to, yes, you need to have a snack at night. So um, the doc, she was eating oatmeal. And I said to her for breakfast, well, what kind of oatmeal? Maple and brown sugar oatmeal. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to eat plain oatmeal and you can put milk on it if if that's what you want. But, you know, and the other thing, which I love my little Hispanic moms, rice is a huge portion of their diet. And you'll say, how much 
How much? What did you have for breakfast? I had a bowl of rice. How big was the bowl? Like a big soup bowl. That's too much. And then when I say cup your hand and cooked rice, if you're having it, what's in my hand? And they're like, that's it? <laughs> yeah, because this is a complex carbohydrate. It's going to shoot your sugar right up. So you've got to work with them on the diet. And it's portion control, portion control, portion. So breakfast, if she wants to have three eggs, that's fine. Because guess what? It's a protein. It doesn't count towards carbohydrates. But one slice of toast, maybe a glass of milk. And you got to watch the milk because the milk is a complex carbohydrate and protein and it may sh throw your sugars over. So I usually tell the girls, write down what you ate and then we can see how it works on your sugars. Does that make sense? So breakfast is usually 30 grams of carbohydrates. That is, um, how many here know um, the little boxes, the little plastic boxes of cereal? Okay. So a little box of cereal, cornflakes, you can have one of those and half uh, four ounces of milk. But you can eat three eggs. So if you're still hungry, eat the protein. The protein helps to alleviate the hunger. Lunch is 45 to 60. I don't know anybody here that can eat 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates. That is a lot. But have your protein. And usually what I say, if you can put the piece of protein in the palm of your hand, that's great. You can have a salad, you can have a piece of fruit, and any you do not want to drink your fruit, you want to eat the fruit. Okay, so fruit juice is big no-no. Um, you need little snacks in between, so like in the morning, mid-morning, a cheese stick. You know, one of those little mozzarella cheese sticks, that will hold you over until you get to lunch. Some patients take a little bit of their lunch and put it to the afternoon. Peanut butter and apple. You get them to eat healthy, but you've got to eat. So when that little girl comes in again, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment. And I'm going to get her some more stuff in Spanish on how she can eat and what she can eat. Um, we don't like fruit for breakfast or mid-morning because it shoots your sugar up too high. And then we've got to try to deal with that. And we want to try to understanding ethnic foods. Years ago, when we first started, when we were doing still um, exchanges, starch and protein and all that other, that was the most confusing, confusing thing we ever did. But I remember one lady came in, she ate goat. And we're like, what? It's a protein, but how much of that can we eat? And I had the dietitian like, losing her mind. And I said, well, and, and she came back, she says, we're going to treat it like lamb. I'm like, okay, you know, because they're in the same ballpark. Uh, but it, it was a challenge because her culture ate a lot of goat. <clears throat> Our Hispanic moms, a ton of rice, you got to get them away from the rice. So there are challenges, um, especially with uh, if mom is lactose intolerant, because what is the treatment in pregnancy for low sugar. How much? Eight ounces of milk and two crackers. Why? If you give them the high glucoses, the problem with the glucose is it shoots it up and shoots it down. Milk is a protein and a complex carbohydrate. What it'll do is it'll bring it up and level it off. And if they're experiencing a low sugar, you give them the milk and tell them to check their sugar in 30 minutes after they've taken it. The problem lies if they're, they, I can't drink milk. Okay, can you eat yogurt? Eat yogurt then. But you got to get that milk, that milk cousin, I call it, yogurt is the milk cousin, protein into them somehow. Okay. Remember key, key, key. Hyperglycemia is a teratogen. You've got to get these under control. And you want to talk to them about what are the meds are they taking. Get a complete list. Um, metformin or N and or glyburide have, have been shown. Um, they have not shown any malformations in their use. I don't see glyburide used 
hardly at all anymore. I think we had one lady and we switched her to insulin. We used to use gliburide quite a bit. Uh, metformin is the drug of choice now. When you are entering medications into Epic, make sure you're putting the correct medicine in Epic. Metformin, for example, comes in 500 and 1,000 dosing. Metformin also comes in extended release in 500 and 1,000 dosing. So when you go in, make sure you're picking the correct one. Ask her, is it, is it plain metformin or extended release? These are insulin pens. These are mine. Uh, they're empty now, but I want you to take a look at here that a lot of people don't realize insulin comes in three strengths. U100, U200, use 500. So when you're selecting the insulin on the meds, make sure you've got the correct one. Um, so I'm going to take these back to the back. I want you to look at them. You screw on a needle onto the tip. Depending on the medicine, um, like Ozempic, which we do not use in pregnancy, Ozempic in the box comes with its own needles. Tracebo, which is a 32-hour insulin, does not. You have to order them separate. So make sure the patient has a way to contact their provider in case they go there. Well, your provider didn't order the needles. And Tracebo is a U200 insulin. So I'm going to hand this to you all so you can look at it and play. Now the dials don't work anymore because there's no medicine, but you can at least see it, and this is the plunger so you can play with it. Just make sure I get back if I got to put it in the appropriate trash on my way to work tomorrow. But a lot of people, when you're doing insulin teaching, they've never seen them before. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> you want to present it that they've not done anything wrong. We just want to make sure best outcome for your baby. A lot of women are terrified of doing insulin. The needle's going to reach my baby. I usually pull out one of the spinal needles that we use for amniocentesis, and I said, this is the needle we use to get fluid from around your baby. Because the needles, which I do not have on those, um, are, if anybody knows measurements, they're 3 8 inch. Because you're going sub-Q. Um, and in fact, the needles on your insulin, these hurt worse than the insulin needles because they're so fine and so tiny. Um, insulin is now still the gold standard for the treatment of type 2 and some gestational diabetes, especially if their sugars are so out of whack early in pregnancy. You're not going to be able to give a metformin throughout because as the pregnancy increase uh, continues, the placenta is growing, the baby's growing, insulin requirements are growing. Okay, here's the drugs. If you do get a patient with glyburide, make sure NICU knows because those are the babies that get admitted. Because for whatever reason, if babies, mom's been on glyburide, the babies don't handle transition well at all. Um, and these, one of the big reasons why we stopped using it and went to metformin is because of NICU admissions. Oops, sorry. Um, metformin inhibits. Okay, every now often these little messages keep popping up and I'm like, is that me? Um, metformin stimulates glucose uptake. 
like I said, 500 to 1,000, usually BID peaks one to three and lasts for 12. Uh, that's the regular metformin. There's an extended release, which obviously lasts longer. <laughs> Why do we start insulin? Um, the fasting is consistently over 95. We may only give them NPH at bedtime. Uh, the one hour and the two hours are consistently elevated. Even though, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to say that patients, when they bring in their glucose logs, lie. Or they make no sense. <clears throat> we had a type 1 many years ago, 18 years old, hadn't been to her appointments, shows up in, uh, in the testing center. They shipped her right upstairs because the baby... Estimated fetal weight was 13 pounds. Type 1 diabetic, but yet all of her glucose logs showed 75, 115. I mean, pristine levels. We had her on the monitor on labor and delivery. We were getting her ready for the section. It was class, uh, it was uh, two strip. Heading to a three, we had very minimal variability, and then the kid tanked, and I mean tanked. We flew to the OR. We had zero, zero APGARs. The baby's cord blood glucose was 325. If the picture's not missed, uh, matching the data, we have a problem. Um, I have one lady right now that we sent back to clinic for further education to draw some more, um, like draw some actual uh, glucose levels when she does her sticks because her her paperwork when it came over, all the blood sugars are 120, 120, 120, 120, 120. What's going on? The biggest reason is noncompliance. Like I said, not for so much. They're denying they're doing it. They're denying that they're diabetic. They're not following any of the program. Or noncompliance because they have a limited education level. Not all of them are that they don't want to do it. They just don't know how to do it. You all, like I said, are BSNs. You're college educated. You are fluent in your language. You can read, write, and put those numbers down. Have you watched them struggle just to put down 122? When you're watching them struggle, you know they're not getting everything and they need a lot more support from us, okay? <clears throat> Insulin. The only type of insulin you can use IV is regular. NPH has an additive to it, which makes it medium acting. Um, Lantus is long acting. They say it works 24 hours. It's more like 22 or 20. So you, when you're working with someone with Lantus, you got to make sure what sugars are you trying to cover? If you're trying to cover the fastings, you want her taking Lantus at night so that you're getting optimal coverage at that eight o'clock or fasting blood sugar in the morning. Um, <clears throat> Lantus covers, uh, gives what's called a basal action. It kind of runs in the background, almost like someone who's on an insulin pump because insulin pumps run basal in the background. And then you have little spikes depending on what you eat. Majority of the stuff that um, you're on today is NPH and regular. They're the easiest things to work with. <clears throat> if you're giving and you, you need to understand with the meds, like sometimes you'll see someone just on NPH at bedtime because we're trying to cover the overnight because during the day she's up and walking. She's moving and her sugars are beautiful. It's that fasting 
that's 120, 130. Well, what is she doing at night? How about sleeping? And she's not up and running around. So you're not burning off your sugars, okay? So when you take NPH at 10 o'clock at night, it's going to go through your system, peak at around 6-ish in the morning, and be out by lunchtime, <clears throat> okay? If you take NPH at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's going to peak, run through lunch, maybe peak about 1 or 2 in the afternoon, and be out of your system by supper. If you're taking regular and you take it before your supper, you're going to counteract whatever you eat because it'll be out of your system within two hours, one and a half to two hours. Same thing with taking insulin regular at breakfast. It'll be out of your system by the time you're ready to take your postprandial breakfast test. Does that make sense? So the patient that comes in, let's see. She came in at five o'clock in the morning. She took 20 units of N at bedtime. Are you worried about her? Five o'clock in the morning. Your fasting should be anything like below 95, like 60 to 95 in that ballpark. Are you going to worry if you don't eat feeder breakfast? Because remember, it's peaking at 6 o'clock. It's going to be working through breakfast. You see where you have to think in the timing of how the meds work? So if you've got a lady coming in tomorrow and she's on NPH, you may, the docs may say to her, only do half the amount of your insulin tonight because your C-section is at eight o'clock in the morning. Or what happened with us one day on labor and delivery, um, and this midwife told the patient, go ahead and take your NPH and regular. Okay, she did it before she came in. And of course we gave her breakfast because we were starting an induction. And then she kicked off in a full-blown gangbang, thank you very much, labor. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she's 5 to 6 centimeters. She's going, going to town there. And guess what her blood sugar was? She took NPH and regular before we had breakfast. Her blood sugar was 35. Why? Well, she didn't eat any lunch. They weren't covering her with 100 of glucose IV because she went into labor so fast. Because when you run an insulin drip to cover your blood sugars, you've got that main line of lactated ringers. That's your bolus bag that if you have to give your antibiotics, if she's got a D-cell and you're going to open it up, Somewhere on there, usually at the, not the bottom port, because that's when you save for pit, but the next port up, you're going to Y in D5W that will run on the pump, on the pump at 100 cc's an hour. Because if she's not eating, she needs calories so that she can labor safely, because we're not feeding her. Then you're doing... On that other Y, you're doing your insulin, regular insulin based on the order set. If your sugar's this, give this much. Insulin, again, is also verified with your second nurse. Please be sure you're doing that. But the D5W you want on that pump at 100 continuous do not use that as your bolus bag. We've had people do that. They're not paying attention. How many here label their IVs in at least four different places on their patient? Do you label it at the top so that even if you're not close, you can see that yellow 
I think ours is yellow for insulin sticker. You see the pink for the mag or pink for pit, whatever it is. I can't remember what the colors are, but you see colors up there that draw your eye to the right bag coming down. If it's in the pump, I label it coming out of the pump. Okay, you're getting called for a crash. You're going to disconnect that pump because that pump ain't rolling with you. You're going to disconnect it, but you got to make sure you're pulling the right one out. Same thing coming out with the pit bag or anything. And then the last but not least, how many here label them going into your insertion sites when you're piggybacking them into the lines? This bottom one is your pit. Get that big sticker there so you can see it. This pit always goes the closest to the patient. Because if you have to ball with someone, you don't want the pit up here and you're running a whole cc of Pitocin into the patient because that's what's laying in the line. Does that make sense? Label, 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 label. Um, key again, anytime you're using insulin, you know you can rotate your sights. You can do the belly, you can do the legs, you can do the backs and the arms. If the family member's there, we can get that big fat pad back here. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Do not use the same sites all the time. Stay away from stretch marks, scars, moles. Um, it's key to have an accurate weight because dosing is uh, created on gestational age and weight of mom, especially if she comes to the AP side. The docs will figure it out. Um, for every unit of insulin, it will change your blood sugar three to five points. So if your fasting in the morning is 120 and you're going to start with NPH, how many units are you going to give her? So if the least amount it's going to change is 30 points, if you give 10 units, so it'll change it 30 to 50 points. So if you're given 10, that fasting then will drop if she's 120 to um, 90 or a little lower. That's how they figure out if they have to make adjustments and it's done by the physician, we just have to give them the information. These are the insulins that we use, Humalog, Novalog. And again, depending on the insurance, which makes us all crazy, like Cigna will only sign for Novalog, which is a brand name versus Humalog, which is generic. They don't want their patients to have the Humalog, they want them to have Novalog drives us nuts in the testing area. NPH, Lenti, Lantus um, are the ones we use. Patients who come in with premixed insulin, in other words, it's NPH and regular combined, in concept, you think it's great, but if you have to increase the one but not the other, you're stuck. Like say you're looking at the sugar, well, we really need to increase the NPH, but the regular is fine. You can't do it with these combos. That's why you have to use separates. And again, when you're documenting in your system, make sure you have the correct U100 dose. The other thing here is when you are using, you're giving insulin and you know that you're teaching the patient how to do it and whatnot. Please do not use a TB syringe. They are not units. TB syringes are parts of a CC. You have to use insulin syringes. Somebody was using TB syringes and you're giving them, you're not giving them the correct dose. Let's just put it that way. Um, rotating the site. Um, one of one of the tricks that a diabetic taught me, because, you know, sometimes uh, the sisters are a little big, so you can't get around to reach the backs of your arms. So one of the tricks she showed me, she said, go to the wall and roll your arm forward. You see how my fat pad just came up? Nice and easy to reach. Like I said, diabetics will teach you tricks like you never... 
And that girl taught me, let's see, she was a class RF diabetic at UCLA Medical Center, which means she had retina and um, kidney damage. Um, those are our sites. That is a very old picture of an insulin pump. They're about the size of what we used to, remember pagers? They're about the size of a pager. Um, obviously, um, we want people to exercise, uh, except if, um, you know, we're trying to keep that blood pressure on a little better control. Um, being a diabetic is not an indicator for a C-section unless you've got a documented macrosomic baby. We don't want to try to deliver a 13-pounder through the sacred space. That just sounds a little painful. Um, again, you must check your glucoses using the hospital equipment, and that then when you put it back in the in the cradle will flow it over so uh, we can see what's going on. This was something I learned at the last conference in 2019 from uh, Susan McMurtry Baird. She wrote the critical care OB book for A1. It's, I think, in third or fourth edition right now. Uh, she did it. Um, she took over from, um, ooh, what's her name? Carol Harvey. And it, like, like I said, if you ever got to hear these ladies speak, I mean, you walk out of there like unbelievable. Anyway, what she told us is when you're priming your insulin, obviously you're not priming your tubing with it in the patient, but run a couple cc's through the tubing. And I'll tell you why. Insulin adheres to the plastic tubing. So you want to run maybe like five cc's, like into a cup or on a paper towel, shut it off, and then hook it up to your patient so that the tubing, um, you know, is well primed and the patient's going to get the insulin, not just the fluid. Um, obviously, uh, you want to, <clears throat> they're obviously not going to eat. Make sure you're aware, make sure anesthesia knows when she had her last doses of insulin. Um, hopefully they've taken their pumps off. Some of the OBs don't want to deal with them because these girls are very comfortable with their diagnosis and they're going to manage their pumps. So there is no policy at this point at ANOVA to manage patients who are diabetic. Um, the type 2s and the GDMs, we can manage those well, but the type 1s can be a bit of a, bit of a stickler sometime. At the uh, four to six week point, the patients need uh, the type 2s and the GDM, well, the the GDMs need to be tested to see if they're going to turn into a type 2, but I can guarantee you uh, maybe 20% return for that test because the other moms are too busy dealing with their baby and their family. Um, like I said, they drop dramatically. Make sure that especially the type 1s are on their pre-pregnant levels, not what they were taking during the pregnancy. Um, the type twos, it just depends on what their what kind of a diagnosis they had afterwards. Hopefully they can get hooked up with their endocrinologist again. But the type, the type ones usually come to the hospital pretty well um, prepared. If they are breastfeeding, sometimes it's now when they're early on, you know, they're getting like barely a tablespoon or barely a tea, half a teaspoon of milk out with the colostrum. So they're not losing volume yet. But as breastfeeding progresses and they're getting more milk out, what you may want to do is have those girls check their sugar before they breastfeed. Because remember, as the baby breastfeeds, they're pulling sugar out of mom. So we don't want mom's blood sugar to tank. Does that make sense? She might need to have a little snack sometimes when she's feeding the little person. Again, anything below 70 is dangerous. If she's pregnant, we want milk and crackers. Um, we went over labetalol. 
hypoglycemic emergency, and the milk and crackers comes from up to date. It's not just willy nilly out of my head. You know, these are what the docs want us to use. Those are your severe symptoms. Briefly, DKA. Has anybody here ever taken care of a patient with DKA? If you're labor and delivery and she's pregnant, you will be living in the ICU on a continuous monitor over there because DKA can kill babies. DKA can occur with a blood glucose at 200. Because if they get dehydrated, usually you hear DKA, they've got 500, they're dehydrated also. But it can happen as low as 200 milligrams per deciliter sugars. So be aware. Um, the, pretty much that when a patient comes in with DKA, you're trying to figure out what's going on. Why is this happening? Usually severe dehydration. Um, it can happen with pump failure. That's why the type ones always have Lantus at home to replace in case the pump dies until they can get a new pump and get everything working again. Um, these babies go into fetal acidosis. It's, it's major problems. Um, these are your precipitating factors, signs and symptoms. How do we diagnose this? Fluid therapy. It is very dramatic on the fluid therapies. Um, this is um, postpartum management. Again, like I said, depending on what type they are coming out of the pregnancy is going to determine if they're on meds. And like I said, 20 to 50 percent receive the postpartum screen. And a lot of it depends on socioeconomic class and, uh, you know, Higher parity and obesity are those are the ones that they don't show up. They just don't show up. So sometimes they don't even come in for their birth control or their six week check to make sure everything's going okay. More more information. How do I get in in the ethic in this? Yeah. Well, right, you got last five minutes. Time. But. I can honestly sit there and say, I don't know how to get into Epic in this. I'm going to show you two screens that I want you to put on your, your, your uh, Duma Jiggy. That one is there. Because oh. yeah. when you go to those Epic classes, trust me, you sat through them. They don't teach you some nuances. I've got two tricks that I want to show you. Um, I'm so glad you're doing all this because I would never do this. Um, I just need to figure out how to share again. Screen window time. Yeah. 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 Oh, it says stop sharing, so it must be there. Uh, right? No, it's not. I have to like pick the right one. Hold on. Share. Window. Just because I gotta go up there and type it. Oh, okay. Remember? It's in the typing. This. Which screen? Oh, that one. Okay. Nope. Nope. Yeah, but I'm up there. Okay, click. Yep, I did. Oh, that one. Yeah. I was on this keyboard. <laughs> ah, there we go.
Yes. Now I still have to use the mousey thing, right? Yes. Are y'all proud of me? I'm using two keyboards. All right. So this is, this is, ladies, this is labor and delivery at Alex. Let me find someone that's not delivered. Uh, where is she at? Okay, we're going to use her. Um, if you click on the patient and you go up to summary. Now, my stuff is already set up like this, so I'm going to open this little thing up here. Um, uh, okay, the first thing I want to show you if you go over here and wrench in, wrench in glucose. And do you see what you get? No one ever told us this, but if you've got a patient that you're doing finger sticks and blood draws, your glucoses will come up as, depending on what one you're doing, from the machine, you'll get the little uh, green and you'll get the actual readings as well as under here, you'll see her diet that she's on, gestational diabetes, whatever. The other thing that comes up is your insulin dose. So you can actually correlate your glucose, your meal, and what your insulin is running at. No one ever showed us this. The ICU girls showed me this. So you go up there and you load glucose, and you can click on it on any patient and you can see that whole profile. The second thing that I loaded into mine only because I'm one of those OCD people, I don't wanna to have to try to look for it again. This is what's called the adult DKA order set. We never knew they had one until we had a patient in the unit. Um, and they said, well, there's a DKA order set. Where, what does it look like? How much insulin are you given? You know, when you're the one sitting at the bedside in the ICU and you don't have your buddies to back up, you gotta know what they're doing. But this is it. There are, try there we go. There are different steps and algorithms based on how sick the patient is. And I think if you're gonna use the fourth algorithm, which are considerable amounts, especially if you've got a woman with a 600 blood glucose, you're usually playing because what the ICU people don't understand that, oh, she's pregnant, you can't give her that much. Yes, you can. We gotta get this glucose down because you're harming the baby. And they're afraid of harming mom and the baby. So they're, they're very gentle in trying to manage it. So at least if you know this is here, this is how you can help your MFM and your um, ICU docs help to manage um, DKA. The last thing I wanna show you is also in this is, remember I said you gotta learn how to trend your labs? If you put labs since admission, you can see them all nice lined up, almost like how I did your presentation. This was the first, this was the second, and you can see the trends up and down, but it's under labs since admission and you can wrench those things in. That's it, ladies. Is this log out over here? Is that it over there? your name in and you get credits. Do you guys have any questions? I know it's not. I don't expect you to walk out and function with a 50 year nurse. Okay. I don't expect it. Ask questions. Whoever your mentor person is, ask questions. Why did you do this? What is this? Bum, bum, bum. But you're, you're always going to find the Betsy on your unit. I'm going to be gone after January of 24, 25. 25. Okay. But until then, 
if you want to come back next year at any time, you just get this fine lady over here. Hey, when is Betsy doing this again? And and since we're getting really technically savvy, you might even not have to come in, but you can get on this this thing we did here, cheese, and watch because we did the last one on Zoom, and then they took Zoom away, and now we're teams. And the technical wonders over here will help make all that work. <laughs> Please, please, please take the reins and run with it. You're what we got now. And you all do fine. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to go out in tears. But just remember why you did this. I still have patients walking in the door. Oh my God, you're still here. And then, of course, they say that. And I'm like, yep, <laughs> I'm still here. Um, but they're always glad to see and teach, 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 teach. Because the best patient is the one that's educated. They will always remember you. The nice nurse that sat and taught me how to give insulin. The nurse that taught me how to do this and that. The nurse that saved my life. 